Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Sopan Deb. Um, I have, I'm the author of this book, Mistranslations, Meeting the Immigrant Parents Who Raised Me. Um, I, uh, I'm a writer for the New York Times. Uh, I'm a comedian on the side. Um, and um, I'm trying to think what else would be relevant. Oh, thank you to all of you for being here. I'm so grateful. This is the first book talk that I'm doing. Um, so prepare for a lot of uh, ums and, and, and still figuring out my shtick here. Uh, I really appreciate all of you being here and I hope all of you are being safe. Um, yeah, and then uh, feel free uh, to ask non-book questions. I'm happy to talk about, you know, if you're a, a, a journalist looking for advice or you wanna talk about anything, dating advice, whatever, I'm here, we have nothing to do. So um, feel free to ask any questions you want and I'm so excited to be here. Lakshmi, you want to introduce yourself? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lakshmi Gandhi. I'm a Lantaj Saja member, and I'm a freelance journalist. Um, I write for several um, outlets, mostly about books, so I was super excited when I was asked to moderate this talk. Um, and yeah, like, um, that's basically it. Like, I've written about books for like NBC News and um, Hello Giggles and a bunch of places, so this has been like really, really cool. And, um, thank you. We can jump right in if you want. Yeah, yeah look, I think, I think let's, just, let's just get started. Okay. Yeah, Lakshmi, thank you for doing this, by the way. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. I went through my ARC shelf and I found your book. So here oh, it is. Great. I'm sure it's even prettier in hardcover. So, <laughs> but I'll jump right in. So this is obviously the South Asian Journalists Association. Like, what is your um, journalism journey? Like, what made you decide, or like, what's your interest? And then what made you pursue it as a career? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I went to, originally went to college to be a sports broadcaster. I wanted to be like the next uh, Mike Breen who calls Knicks games and whatnot. And then um, I really got bored with sports, uh, which is funny because I'm an NBA writer now. Um, I got bored with sports. Uh, I eventually started doing documentaries and I produced a bunch of documentaries in my 20s and then found myself, uh, my big thing was uh, I covered the Trump campaign for CBS. That was kind of my big career break. Um, and that was really exhausting year and a half, two years or so of my life. Um, and then uh, from there, I was really fortunate. The Times hired me to uh, write about culture for them. Uh, they knew I did comedy and they knew I'm a musician. They knew all this stuff about me and they felt like I was a good fit. And, um, and that is the short version of, and that now I've been at the Times for about three years, uh, a little bit more. And so um, anyway, so that's, that is the short version of my journey. No, definitely. And you mentioned in the book that you were, like, as you mentioned, like a lot of us got to know you through your coverage of the Trump campaign. And the book talks a lot about how you were one of the only journalists of color on the trail during this like campaign where not only was it like, well, there was a lot of rhetoric about immigrants. You're obviously the child of immigrants. There's a lot of rhetoric about brown people in general. Like, how do you think like, how did that shape like how you approach the story in terms of like being the only one with the experience of being a person of color? So I went, so the, so to, for context, I was one of about five reporters that covered the Trump campaign from start to finish. Um, and I was often the only person of color, not just in the press corps, but in the entire room of thousands and thousands of Trump supporters. And that, it, it changes the way you look at things. Um, it changes, you have a different experience and things stand out to you that don't stand out to other reporters. You know, I was, you know, I had someone come up to me once and ask me if I was uh, shooting photos on behalf of ISIS. And, um, you know, that always stuck with me. And another time someone asked me, um, someone told me to go back to Iraq where I came from. Like, I'm not Middle Eastern. I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, I've never even been to the Middle East. I'm, I'm, I'm of Indian descent. Um, I'm from New Jersey, you know, that's, um, but oftentimes you, you just get reduced. Um, the other thing that was kind of weird, you know, the weird thing that happened was when I got arrested covering the Trump campaign in Chicago. And, uh, you know, I was thrown to the ground by Chicago police after a canceled rally. And that was a moment where I was, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think this happens to me if I'm a white journalist because I didn't do anything wrong. And there were several cameras that showed I didn't do anything wrong. I got charged with resisting arrest. And that, um, and that uh, eventually um, the charges got dropped obviously because I didn't do anything wrong. But the fact that it even happened to me, I was like, oh, 
I don't think this happens to white people. And so that, that is where being a person of color covering Trump really, those were the times where it really stood out to me. But, you know, I, I the day that really stands out to me is um, the day of the original Muslim ban, which was, if I recall correctly, December 7th, 2015. And, and he, he takes out a piece of paper and he reads it word for word. He says, we're going to uh, ban all Muslims from coming into the country until we figure out what the hell is going on. And, you know, I'm not Muslim, but I certainly know a lot of people that, you know, are brown that are Muslim. And um, I remember the entire crowd at this, this battleship, not too far away from where I am right now in Charleston, um, 1,500 people standing up and cheering and giving him a standing ovation for this. I remember that being very, um, I, found that, I found that very jarring. It's something I'll never forget for the rest of my life, uh, that moment. And so those were the times where being a person of color really changed my, um, my outlook on things. And what was it like, like, you know, obviously afterwards talking to voters at these rallies and like um, approaching them, knowing that they're cheering, like cheering, banning immigrants. That, that particular night was interesting because I, I talked, so we, Trump initially releases a statement on the original Muslim ban early in the day. Um, and so we're all shocked by this. So the entire day, cable news networks, Twitter, everyone's, you know, going hard at Trump both sides of the aisle saying, this is bad, this is not good policy, it's racist, it's this and that. So yet every single person I spoke with that night at this battleship called the USS Yorktown, not one person said this is a bad idea. Everyone was like, that's, that's why he's a great candidate. That's the kind of stuff we need in this country. And for me, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey. You know, I went to college in Boston. You know, I lived in New York for the last six or seven years. For me, that was really jarring because that is just, that's not the world that I grew up in, you know? And, you know, and so it was a very strange, it was, it was a strange, definitely at, at best, it was a strange moment. And are you surprised that this like anti-media rhetoric in particular has continued to this day? Or like, you know, this like, oh, Trump is turning or he's like getting more serious, but like- the No, I mean, watch me, I don't know about you. I don't know about how many people in their seventies change who they are. You know, how, how, many, how many people do that? How many people fundamentally are able to change their worldview? And what incentive has Trump had to really change who he is? He, he did exactly what he did and became the most powerful person in the world. Why would he change? What's the incentive to change? I'm not saying he's right or wrong. I'm saying there's been no actual incentive for Donald Trump to change his behavior. Whether you think that's good or bad, he's, the same. he's, he's who he's always been and he's always who he said he's going to be. Um, he got, he won on a platform of causing chaos. And, um, so for him, this is, uh, this is what he got elected to do to shake things up or, you know, you know, be an outsider and, you know, all those kind of, you know, platitudes that you heard during the campaign. No, definitely. And I just want, I also had a question about like the nitty gritty of the trail. So I used to check your feed every day because you had like every quote transcribed perfectly, seemingly within seconds. So I know that like a lot of people, journalists hate transcribing. How are you so good at it? <laughs> um, I'm going to give you an honest answer. So I've been playing the piano since I was really young. Mm -hmm. um, I actually was originally considering going to school to play piano. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually auditioned for the Berkeley College of Music. So my fingers, I, I don't know this is scientifically the case, but I think my fingers naturally move faster because I play the piano. Um, and to your point about being on Twitter, um, part of it's also just, I just, I just did it, you know, and I, I transcribed everything, but I've since made up for it. I went from having a pretty useful Twitter account to the most useless Twitter account in the world, you know, so um, I'm, I apologize to all the people that follow me and think they're going to get good insight. That was a long time ago. Um, now it is entirely, I have no idea why you guys are still, still sticking around. So, well, like, obviously given that, like, like you said, um, a bunch of us started following you because of your experiences at the Trump campaign, a ton of your fellow journalists on the trail have written political books, but this is a very, this is a very personal memoir. Like, um, you could have easily written a political book. Like, what made you want to do this? Uh, why didn't I want to write a, a political book? Um, <laughs> I feel like there is almost way too many of them. And I feel like I have nothing to say about Donald Trump or our current state of politics that isn't being said already. 
You know, it's, it's, there's, there's just a huge, if you go to amazon.com and type in Donald Trump book, there's like probably hundreds of them. Um, I don't think I have anything interesting to say about politics or my time covering the trail that would take up the entire book. Um, I think there are, there's plenty of literature out there if you're really interested. I just, I don't think I have anything unique to say. Um, I did feel I had something unique to say in, in, in this, but I don't, I don't feel I had anything to, unique to say about how Trump got to where he is and that kind of stuff. There are much, and also not for nothing, I'm just another guy with an opinion. Like, I, I don't have anything, I don't, you know, I remember the morning of election day, I was on the plane ride back with the press corps on the way back from Trump's last rally, which was in Grand Rapids at like one in the morning or something like that. And I remember looking at the map with, with, and, and, and predicting, you know, Hillary Clinton's gonna win this state, this state, she's gonna come close in Texas or whatever. And I was way off, you know? So like, what right do I have to write a book, you know, on politics? Like I'm, I, I have, I, I was as shocked as anybody that Trump won. So I, I don't have anything, um, you know, I, I'm unqualified in a way, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, definitely. And um, like you've mentioned, um, those experiences, especially the Muslim ban and like hearing all this rhetoric. Um, so you were estranged from your family and like this experience made you want to like delve into your roots and reach out. Like how did, how did you get there? And like that must have been a very emotional journey. It was emotional. Um, I'm going to, uh, the simple answer is that my parent, I hadn't, I hadn't seen my dad in more than 10 years. And I hadn't seen my, I didn't, I, I hadn't seen or spoken to my mom in several years. I literally didn't know where they were living. I didn't, I had guesses. I didn't know where. And the simple answer is my parents are, I didn't know their ages, but I assumed, you know, by law of biology that they were in their seventies to eighties or whatever the age. And I, I was worried they would die soon. And if they died without me having a chance to get to know them, I, cause I didn't even know basic information about them. Right. I didn't know their ages, where they came from, how they met, how they came to this country, how, you know, uh, what their marriage was, like, what their wedding was like, what they were like as kids, extended family. I didn't have any answers to any questions about them. And I didn't want them to pass away without getting those answers, because those answers fundamentally make up who I am as a person. And so that's where it came from, because I was afraid that we were running out of time. And I'm at, I'm at a stage in my life where, you know, I'm in my 30s now. Um, I have other things, you know, I, I'm at a stage in my life where I'm mature enough where I can look inwards and have a discussion with them about who we are as, as people, as family members, as children, as parents. And so, so that's essentially what pushed me to find them again. Definitely. And Hassan Minaj writes the intro to this book. He obviously like famously wrote like about an Indian American story about a family. And mm -hmm. like, so there are this whole like, there's a but like, your story is obviously very different, but like, it's part of this like new canon and exploring like those of us who are now in their 20s and 30s, our experience coming of age in the United States, right? Yeah. What so I, I had two moments where I felt just profoundly seen growing up. One was watching The Namesake with Cal Penn, and the other one was seeing Hassan, Hassan's um, Netflix special, uh, Homecoming King. And those were profound moments for me. Uh, like when I, I was 18, I think, when I saw The Namesake, and I remember watching it. It was about this Bengali family. I think I forget exactly where they grew up, but it's based on the Joe Valeri novel. And, mm -hmm. and I was just so, I was like, oh, this is oh my God, that, I'm, I'm seen right now. This guy's sharing my story. And uh, same thing for ha Hassan's special, where I'm like, oh my God, he too grew up in a suburb and he had trouble um, you know, around a, a white upbringing, yeah, I mean, a white suburb or whatever. And so that partially pushed me to realize, oh, I can tell my story too. If, if, if Cal Penn can be on screen talking about this stuff, if, if now, now, Cal Penn was acting, right? Um, but still, you know, seeing Jupal Heary's work on screen was formative. If Hassan can be on stage talking about his own story, um, and then there's several others, right? Hari Khan Balu, uh, Aparman Ancherla, you know, other brown people that are putting their stories out there. Mindy Kaling, of course. Um, I felt like, I felt empowered, you know? And so um, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to do, I'm going to go, I have a book proposal idea. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I did it, you know, in conjunction with my now fiance, Wesley, who's a, if you guys haven't, she's on here somewhere. Um, you guys can't see her face. 
um, but she was she was formative in in also putting this together. But um, having those influences really pushed me to do this because otherwise I would have been like, well, who's going to want to read this? Who's going to want to buy this? You know, this this kind of story. You know, there's no audience for it. And though and Hassan and has shown that there is an audience for what for talking about what he has to offer you know, and with the Patriot Act and other, you know, the one man show, et cetera. So anyway, so that, that's how this, they all factor in here. No, and that chapter where you're figuring, like you mentioned, you didn't know where your parents lived. So there was that, like, that it was almost like a mystery novel, like when you're figuring out, when you're like retracing the steps and like figuring out where they lived and like, how did you get them on board with this project? We learned <laughs> about your family here. So. Um, so I, I, it's a good question. Um, with my dad, it was really interesting because he thought the whole time that I was writing a book about India, like he thought I was writing like, I think something this is un that is shared among um, Indians and the generation before us is that they have a lot of kind of nationalistic pride about India. So I think my dad thought that I was writing a book about like the history of India. So when we sit down and, and, and I sit down for an interview and I'm like, okay, dad, this is for the book that I've told you several times is about our family and the difficulties we've had us reconnecting. He goes, okay, so you're writing a book about India. I'm like, well, not about India, about us. He's like, oh, like the history of our family. And like, even then it took a while for it to sink in. My mom understood what I was doing a little bit earlier on. Um, but the whole, look, the process was difficult. I, I won't, I won't lie about that. It, the process was difficult. They both had their issues with the final product, the questions I was asking, and some of that plays out in the book. Um, they had issue. I mean, there were several things I discovered in the process. Look, this process, and this is for any of you that uh, are reconnecting with an old uh, a friend or a family member or whatever, this process requires you to look inward. Um, we as humans, we often, um, it's hard for us to look inward because oftentimes we're like, this thing has happened to me. Why is this bad thing happening to me? Why is this person annoying me? Why am I, why is this person I'm in a relationship with? Why are they mistreating me? Meanwhile, oftentimes we never think to ourselves and go, well, what am I doing to contribute to the situation? Right? What, what did I do for this to happen? And in this particular case, it required all of us to do that. And not everyone has that ability or has that willingness or wants to. And so um, it was difficult um, and it was not an overnight process. And that process is still continuing to this day, I would say. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, I feel like anyone who has written about South Asian American or just second generation immigrant kid issues, like I feel like everyone's done a story about like how hard it is for immigrant kids to talk about mental health or how hard it is in our communities to talk about therapy, to talk about depression, to talk about all those things and this book obviously talks about those things like what was it like like kind of breaking that barrier not only talking about them with your parents but then also just sharing it with the world when you might not have been used to it <laughs> um sharing it with the world was again all of this was difficult all of it um but i would say part of the problem is, is that and i think and i want to make clear that i don't think that my story is like you know, all South Asian stories, you know, this is not, this is not representative, you know, it, um, so I don't want people to look at this and say, oh, this is the South Asian experience. It's not. Some parts of it are, some parts aren't. This is not a um, monolith. But um, one thing that I found, I think, slightly universal in the conversations I've had with other brown people of my generation, of our generation, I should say, um, is that, look, we never talk about feelings growing up. Like, Lashmi, did you talk to, did you, I'm sure there are a lot of people on this uh, Zoom meeting that can weigh in. Like, did you talk to your family about, like, feelings? And, like, if you had a, I, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, did you ever talk to your family about that? Not as a child. Like, as no, a great. And, and so, meanwhile, I grew up in a mostly white suburb. And my white friends, my, the kids, and like, you know, they're, like, talking to their family about crushes and being bullied at school and, 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 and I'm like, I can't go to my parents about that. Part of that is the generation before me, so my parents' generation, when they came to this country, they came here to survive. They didn't have much. So their objective on a day-to-day -day basis was to make it to the end of the day, just make it to the next day. Whereas I grew up, you know, with the intention 
I, I had the freedom to grow up and think about my feelings and think about emotional capacities and think about pursuing creative things like being a musician and being a journalist and, and you know, traveling and all that. My parents never really had the freedom to do that. My, my, I, had the, I had the freedom to think about therapy. I've, see, I've seen a therapist, you know, in, in my 20s. It's not that my parents, you know, like rejected therapy. They didn't even have the language to say no to it. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know like what family communication was supposed to be like because they didn't. That's not what they were thinking about. They were just trying to get to get to bed without something terrible happening. Um, so these were all not easy conversations to have. I will say that what was writing the book was cathartic. It was therapeutic. It was for me. It was therapy writing the book because. For years, I've wanted to have these kind of conversations. For years, I wanted to have the conversations that my friends were having with, with their parents, you know? And, and for years, I wanted to have that kind of relationship. So look, was it easy having those conversations? No, but writing it was very, very cleansing in many ways. And um, during the reporting of this book, you um, visit India for the first time. So like, what was that like? And you meet um, a whole slew of relatives that you mentioned you didn't know existed. So, like, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so India, my so we we I went to see my father. He lives. I found out in the course of this book that he lives. He lived in Kolkata, and um, it was exhausting. It's India. I think in we went in July, so it's like a hundred. It's about. It's slightly cooler than the sun like as a whole. Um, and so it's, it's hot, it's crowded, it's, it's, it's exhausting even when you are not reconnecting with your father for the first time mm -hmm. in 11, 12 years, right? And so, um, it, so it was intense. Mm -hmm. um, seeing my father was really surprising, like seeing the state he was in and that he was really like healthy and, and, and living life to the fullest. He's, he was telling us about a cosmology club and he's playing tennis and golf and yoga. He's traveling. And I'm like, that is not the dad that I knew growing up, growing up, the dad I knew growing up. And pardon me for using this word. Like he was a, like a square, you know, he wouldn't, he was, his idea of a good time growing up was memorizing the periodic table. Okay. Now, you know, he's like, Oh, we're going to go see tigers and we're going to go do this. And we're going to do that. And I'm like, what, who are you? Who is this man that I haven't seen in more than a decade? And why do you have more hair than I do? Like what is going on here? Um, so it was a very, um, it, it, it was, it was just a, the whole thing was a very shocking experience. Um, but I'm glad we went, I'm glad we went through it because, you know, who knows when I see my father again, um, you know, who knows what can happen, but at least we, we will have those memories to share together, regardless of how our relationship turns out and how this process continues. So as anyone listening to this, like, this is not like a light read in many aspects. So like, were there any parts, like as you were writing, you're like, I need a break, or maybe I don't want to include this, or I need a nap or whatever it is. Like, you know, like, was there any- uh, uh, All of the, all of the above. First of all, watch me, you don't have to convince me to take a nap. Like, I, <laughs> like you had me at nap. I'm good. Um, uh, yeah, there were parts where I, I, I had difficulty of being like, I don't know. I, I don't think I could write this. Um, yeah, there was some stuff where I wondered if I should include it. But I, what I told my parents from the very beginning to the very end was that um, this was going to be an unvarnished look at our family and this journey. We're going to, what's different, what makes this, the book, this book different than other traditional memoirs is that there's very little recall in the book. The book is all based on recordings, video, Almost all the quotes this year are accurate, like to the word. Um, the ones, you know, or they're based on copious note taking. A lot of memoirs you have to like, oh, when I was six, this happened. And this, this is not quite like that. And I really wanted to capture the book in its, um, so I wanted to capture what I was feeling in the moment. And yeah, there are sometimes, and, and Wesley, my, my fiance, can attest that there's sometimes where I just didn't want to do it. I don't want to write about it. I was tired of it. I was tired. I was like, this, this book is dumb. Uh, this is a bad idea. I'm done. I was, you know. I, I am internally somewhere like a five-year-old sometimes. Um, and usually it's a day that ends with why. And uh, I'm, I'm, I was just like, I'm tired. I'm good. I, I don't want to write this anymore. Um, I'm going to go watch cartoons. And um, that's where Wesley was really helpful. And she was kind of the, um, she was kind of like the anchor. She's like, okay, just step back. Or she, she, she's kind of like a coach. She'd know when to push me, when not to push me. Um, so so yeah, that that's that was that's pretty much how that happened. Uh, and the flip side 
side of it, was there any sections or are there any sections that you're particularly proud of? Like this is like, oh, when you wrote them or when you're working on them, you're like, this is why I'm doing this. Um, yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, I don't want to give away too much right now, mm -hmm. but, but there's a section where I say bye to my father. And that is the only section of the book that I continue to reread um because I just um that's a very meaningful part of the book to me um and um I hope all of you buy it um uh, if you can and I hope that you all agree uh, when you get there but that was um that was because you that's the chapter where I felt because it's kind of near the end of the book or whatever um and that's a chapter where I felt like okay that's a, this is the where the growth happens this is where my father is no longer a footnote in my life. Whereas I think early on in the book, as I said, this really is, you know, captures me feeling in the moment. Early on the book, the tone's a little bit more uncertain. I don't know who about who I am. I don't know who my parents are. And, and then the tone kind of gets more confident as the book goes on. So I would say, I would say saying bye to my father was, was, is the chapter that I'm most proud of. No, definitely. And this is the question I like, almost always end my um, conversations with, like, authors with. But, like, what, what do you want your readers to take away from this? Because, like, um, like you said, the story isn't complete. Like, this is a journey that's, like, continuing. And you indicate that at the end of the book. But, like, what did you take away? And what do you want us to take away? <laughs> so, I think this book, um, if you have a relationship with someone, that should be better. It could be a friend, a coworker, a family member. I think this book is for you. I don't think this book is just for South Asians, um, nor do I think this is the book of all South Asians. I think if this, I think if there's a message here, it's that it, it, if there's a relationship you have with someone that you think should be better, it's never too late to try. That doesn't mean you'll be successful. That doesn't mean the attempt will work. That doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. It just means that there, here's a one, one guy's story about how he tried when he thought it might've been too late. Um, in terms of what I took away from it, um, I'm still processing that. I will probably be 80 years old, you know, and I will still be processing that. Um, if I wrote this book today, if I started, if I, if I started this journey two years later, I, it would be a di much different book because I'm a much different person now. Um, so I think, and by the way, and the other thing I should say is if you're estranged from a friend or family, I mean, this, this doesn't mean you have to reconnect with them. You know, there's, there's, there's a certain, um, there's no obligation. You know, um, like some people do things to you that may be unforgivable and that's okay. You know, forgiveness is not a, a, a obligation. Healing is not an obligation. Um, so, so, so that's the long answer. Short answer is I'm still processing what my takeaways are from this whole process. Mm -hmm. so that's a bad sentence, but you get the point. Great, um, and like we have a couple of questions already and like we encourage hey. you type them into the chat if you have questions or tweet us or just get them to us. Um, so from Priya, what pushed your decision? So you mentioned that like when you're in college, you were moving away from sports journalism and now obviously you're covering the NBA now. So like what made you do this full circle after covering the election? Um, I lost a bet. No, I'm just kidding. Um, honestly, uh, I had been writing about culture for a couple years at the New York Times. And the new sports editor of the Times, this guy, Randy Archibald, he came to me. He said, "We know you love ball, watching basketball. We love your voice. Why don't you come? You know, be the new NBA guy." And I was like, "Why not? You know, every you know, every two years, I try something kind of new. And you know, and this was this was, I thought, an incredible opportunity. Um, and I think if I was like a daily beat reporter, in the way that like." you know, other reporters are and they're in the locker room every day and they're, and they do great work that I totally admire them. And they're the reason that I'm able to follow coverage as well as, as I can. Um, I think, but that's not for me. The, the way the Times covers sports is that we kind of look at things from 20,000 feet up. And that, that to me is a, is a, for me, a more interesting um, more and more fulfilling for me personally. So that's how I'm back in the sports world. Um, I, and it's the best job I've ever had. It's crazy because I, I, the thought of covering sports in my first 10 years or so out of college was, was like a, a nightmare to me. But right now I have the best job I will ever have in my life, no matter what, no matter what happens. Um, so uh, I'm very fortunate um, that the Times lets me, lets me run wild. I hope they don't realize anytime soon how much I'm uh, tricking them here. 
No, that's great. Our second question is from Natasha. How do you know when you're at a place in the, your career to write a book? Uh, how do I know? There is, but there is no blueprint to that. Um, it's when you have something to say. So if you're 22 and you have something to say, say it. Um, the thing I would say is a lot of people don't write books or don't write pilots or don't write films or don't write, don't do their creative projects because they don't think they can do it. Okay. And here's the truth. And this is especially the case with people of color. Okay. Here's the truth. Most of us have something to say. It is up to you to say it, uh, whether it's in a book form or whatever, you know, it's up to you to make that happen. Because if you're not, there's some, you know, mediocre average white male that is definite that definitely thinks they have something to say and they are going to say it. they're going to get those book deals they're going to get the that pilot bought they're going to get that play put on you know at a workshop at the new york theater workshop they're going to do that so um there is no you know you could be 22 you could be 52 you could be 82 it doesn't matter um there's no one right point um i you know i one of my favorite memoirs i've read is by aaron lee carr who is the daughter of david carr um, the, uh, the former New York Times journalist. And, you know, she, it's a brilliant, beautiful memoir. And she, I think, wrote it in her 20s. You know, um, you know I think Malala has, has a book, uh, you know, wrote a book or, uh, you know, and she, she's how old now? You know, I mean, I mean there's no, um, age is a barrier that I think um, we, we create for ourselves. Now, is it going to be easy? No, it's not easy. Is it, does it require connections? Yeah, this book was not easy to sell. The proposal, even though we worked really hard on the proposal and spent four months on it, it was not an easy book to get publishers to, you know, be sold on it. That, uh, and and um, so it's harder institutionally for people of color to get their projects. But that's the case in Hollywood. That's the case in publishing. That's the case in journalism, frankly. Um, but, but, the, but don't create barriers for yourself by saying you can't do it. You definitely can. Um, it's up to you to do, do you, you, it's up to you to do the stuff that you have control over. Our third question from Dave is actually related to Twitter. Um, he says, I enjoy, I enjoy your Twitter feed perhaps a little too much, even though I don't care at all about basketball. As a, <laughs> as a reporter, do you have to moderate yourself to stay within the bounds of good taste? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, I, I, I think you have to be, um, look, you have to be careful. And I have to be careful, particularly as a New York Times reporter, because, you know, everything that I say can be perceived as the stance of the New York Times. And there have been, you know, a couple of times where I've had to, you know, I've received deserved talkings to from my higher up saying like, hey, you can't, you can't be saying that. You can't, you can't be doing this. And, and they were right. And I've had to be able to catch myself. So now, you know, I try to be, anodyne in my feed and if i if i have something to say it's either related to my beat it's related to something i have expertise in or it's me just being you know just just silly you know um but that's not that's not how, that, but how you use social media is totally up to you um i mean within the bounds of your company but some people are only want to use it for serious stuff and you know and i certainly have in the past when i was covering trump um, but it's totally up to you, you know, um, just be careful and, and remember that you're held accountable for the things you say um, in public. Definitely. Our next question is, um, I think, is one that a lot of us have, like, you'll probably be asked a lot, is like, Perna, like, can you speak about why you felt estranged from your family and why that long gap happened? And is that something yes. that is... And the second part, is that something that's representative of like South Asian culture or like the way we talk to each other in South Asian communities? So my parents were arranged to get married. They are both from India and they had a really toxic arranged marriage, but they stayed together for 30 years. I'm not saying that arranged marriages by themselves are toxic. What is unusual is that my parents, what is, what is common I think though is, is the fact that divorce is stigmatized. So my parents stayed together for 30 years when I think in, in kind of a, in a normal, healthy world, they would have divorced after a week because they were toxic. They were bad match from the start. My mother didn't want to get married to my father. And it was just, it was just two mismatched souls here. And so that created a kind of colded atmosphere growing up. 
You combine that with the fact that we grew up in a mostly white suburb, um, in a place called Howell, New Jersey, right by Point Pleasant, near where the Jersey Shore was filmed. Um, and it, when you put all that together, I had nothing to connect with my parents about. They didn't understand. Frankly, I love basketball. My dad didn't know what basketball was. Meanwhile, down the street, I'm watching my white friends being coached in basketball by their friends and by, excuse me, by their by their father, and then and then being uh, taken to the Knicks games or whatever. That creates a gap because you're suddenly looking around and being like, "Oh man, I wish I could do that with my dad." You know, um, you, you know, my friends are um, you know going on dates. I can't talk to my parents about that kind of stuff. Um, and then you just factor in the, you know, and just the lack of communication generally. We didn't know how to talk to each other. We didn't, in fact. Uh, we rarely ate dinner together. We rarely spoke, you know, we really spoke about anything. When I say I didn't know anything about my parents and this book is meeting them, it's, it's almost literally true. I met them physically and that we grew up in the same household, but I didn't know anything about them. And that goes both ways. Uh, my parents didn't know, didn't know anything about me. And to the point that, um, my, my, mom, my, my mom did not know what college I was attending until the accept, what colleges I'd applied to until acceptance letters started coming in. Like that's how, that's how disconnected we were. We're, we're. It was like living with your, uh, a college roommate that you're not close to. You know, we never, we rarely spoke, we lived in the same household and that's, that's where the estrangement came from. So when my mom and I lost touch, it wasn't like, it didn't even recur to me that we had lost touch. We just, she was just not a person in my life that I noticed we had lost touch. Um, so it's just what I grew up with. I was just not used to um, families, like tight knit families, just not something I was familiar with. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I have a question related to that. Like, how did you figure that out all on your own? Like, I feel like um, a lot of kids need help applying to college. Like, I mean, I just didn't know what I was doing at 17. So like, you know, like navigating that process on your, did you have other adults helping you? Not really. Um, I think I just did it because you have to sometimes because your mind, you know, sometimes, you know, in the same way that like if you have a journalism deadline, right, and you know you have to file it by six o'clock, otherwise you miss your deadline, you have to do it. You have to figure it. There's no like you can whine about it. You can be like, oh, I'm so mad about this, but you have to do it. The, the debt, you know, the world keeps turning on its you know, rapidly on its axis. So um, you have to do it. So, um, just did it. I, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm sure I asked guidance counselors for help or something. I don't, you know, but I remember, I remember my college essay being around. <laughs> speaking of white culture, um, I remember my college essay was about because I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. My entire college essay was about how my ideal life was uh, living the life of Ray Barone uh, in Everybody Loves Raymond, and Ray Barone, uh, played by Ray Romano, of course. Uh, that was one of my favorite shows growing up um, because I lack taste. Um, um, uh, I loved the show and Ray Romano was the sports writer in the show. And so I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. So my entire college essay is about everybody loves Raymond. Mm -hmm. So, um, and our next question is uh, about your comedy. Like how much do you think your comedy career influenced your journalism and vice versa? Uh, they didn't. They're very separate. Um, I started off doing improv about eight years ago and then I started doing stand-up. Um, improv is useful. Improv actually is because, and I think everybody that is on this call, anyone that you know, anyone, you know, everyone should do an improv class because uh, even if you're not interested in comedy, it helps you socially, helps you professionally. There's very low stakes. It's very accessible. It's a very accessible form of humor. Um, and it changes the way you think. It, like one of the big myths about improv is that you have to be fast and quick and funny. It's not. That is the first thing you learn in Improv 101 is that it's not about being fast. It's not about being funny. It's about being honest and it's about being supportive of those around you. So you take those two things, you can see why they would help you with your, with you professionally. Where I see one thing, say, you know, a bottle of water, you know, where you guys see one thing, I see five, you know, glass half empty, glass half full, bottle of water, ship in a bottle, you know, you go, you know, you just, so, so you might be facing a complicated problem at work. And, and, and now with your, when your brain has gone through improv, you start thinking a little differently. Um, but beyond that, I've kept the two very separate because look, you know, you know, in the same way that look, Steve Martin plays the banjo. Uh, he's also a comedian. Those are two separate things. I play basketball, you know, not well, mind you, but I play basketball and I do journalism. It's, it's, it's two very different worlds. So um, now it has, it has helped me in like become a better storyteller 
because a lot of my stand-up is about telling stories on stage. And in that respect, it's helpful. But I try to keep the two pretty separate. Cool. And the next one is about the writing process from Kaylee. Do you write chapters? Like, can you talk a little bit more about your writing process? Do you write chapters in order? Or do you have a word goal per day? Or what does your process look like for you? Uh, chapter uh, in order. Um, I just wrote, I, I just wrote, uh, usually we wrote like a chapter, I, I, you know, I, I basically, I didn't take book leave for this. So what would happen, so, um, so what would happen is I'd come home from work, eat dinner, open the laptop back up and start writing. And so we usually did, it took me probably about three, four months to write. Uh, I think I might be the only author in history who submitted his book six months ahead of time. Um, a bit ahead of the deadline, uh, much to much to uh, my editor's chagrin because he didn't want to deal with it until it was ready, until late in the process. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I just wrote it in order, um, and then we we would edit a chapter at a time. Uh, but that's some people will submit the whole manuscript at, at at the end at once, and you know it just depends on your own personal style and what your editor wants. I think a lot of novels, if you're if you're interested in writing a novel, I think those don't get pitched until the whole novel's finished. Uh, in this case, you know the proposal came and then, you know, and then we started writing it. And then um, I'm sure a lot of people watching or listening um, are thinking about books. Like how, what was the process like getting an agent and like the nitty gritty of like getting started with that? Um, 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 that's a good question. Um, so my agent, so I'm represented by CAA and um, CAA came to me after the election and, you know, they were interested in representing me in any and all things. So, you know, if I want to go do a pilot or do comedy writing or write a book or write films or whatever, so CAA would represent me in that stuff. Um, so in this case, CAA, I was already under the CAA umbrella and I came to them and I said, I have a book idea. What can we do with it? And then they, then they introduced me to the book people, uh, the book agent. Uh, sat me down, looked at the idea, and said, "Okay, I can I can make this happen. Let's 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 try this." Uh, but just just to underscore this, just to give you an idea of how hard it is, this book was hard to sell, even though I'm a writer for the New York Times. I have you know a pretty big platform on social media. We worked the book proposal. We worked pretty hard on it. It took four months to put together. Um, I was represented by CAA, one of the most powerful agencies in the world, and it still was very hard to sell. So um, it kind of gives you an idea of how tough the industry is, especially for people of color. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, our next question from Binesh, you mentioned you doubted yourself at times while writing the book. What did you tell yourself and how did you like work through and get through those times? Uh, doubting myself. Um, okay, so I told you about the deadline. I mean, I just had to do it. One thing, again, Wesley, my fiance, was my rock throughout this process. So she was how she took, she, she lightened the load all the time. But more than that, like, hey, listen, I committed to doing this deal. I, I committed to, excuse me, I committed to do, completing this journey. So it, I had to do it. Like not doing it wasn't really an option. So um, there was never a, really a moment where I thought, um, I can't finish this. You know, I'm, I'm not going to finish writing this book. There, that never happened because it never, it never even occurred to me. Um, so you have to do it. Um, and, and that's pretty much how men, the mentality of, with which I approached it. Definitely. And um, somebody asked like or way early on, like, what, how do you think we can support, so, like you said, it is harder for um, writers of color. Like we, we see like more quote unquote, more South Asian stories, but it's like, is it more, it's like more than zero, but like, you know, there are so many voices that are still like struggling to break through. Like how can we support those voices? So, I have to give a very selfish answer here, but I'm gonna to get to it in a second. Um, there has been a surge of South Asian stories in the last couple of years. There has been. But like, if you go from zero to three, that's a surge, right? Like that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean there is a lot, you know, um, you know, in the past couple of years, you know, Hasan Minhaj, the Minhaj has the Patriot Act and, you know, Mindy Kaling is really, um, you know, churning out a bunch of, you know, South Asian, you know, content uh, with her deal with Netflix, et cetera. Um, so there has been, um, there have been uh, more of these stories sold. Is that enough? No, of course not. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, um, so so in answer, in terms of 
how to support other you know south asian artists or any people of color when when they're getting a book proposal from me or whatever what they're inevitably the thing they're thinking about is can we make money off this can we sell this you know are people going to buy this um so if you want to you know so you have to show that this is going to be successful you know real progress is when we can fail in this sphere and still continue to get prog uh, projects you know you know <laughs> white you know movies you know telling white stories starring probably white people they can flop and they're going to get more opportunities south asians you know i don't think they're at that point yet you know but like if you look at crazy rich asians you know uh that was a, a hit at the box office huge parasite you know other stories of, by, by people of color you know but they have to be hits in order for those stories to break through um so now to the selfish point about about you know, uh, to the question of how can we support? Look, um, something that I ha I, I've had a lot on my mind here is um, I don't want to, uh, I don't want the next person, the next South Asian writer who has a story to tell, to pitch a book and the, and the editors look at it, look at the proposal and they say, you know, we tried this with Sopan, it didn't really sell. You know, that would be, I, I would hate that. I would love to, I would, what I would love for happen is, you know what, Sopan told his story, we tried, we took a risk on him, uh, uh, you know, Day Street uh, and HarperCollins, you know, bought this book and it sold and we should do more of these stories. That's what, that's what I would like to happen. Now for me personally, if one of you guys, anybody comes to me and says, hey, I read your book, it moved me and it's inspired me to reconnect with X person, then I'm, I'm good. I've, I've reached a lot of fulfillment for this. However, um, I would like, you know, I would like to sell a lot of copies because I would like to, sh all, all the production, all the publishing houses that passed on it and said, no, 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 we're not going to tell the story. Um, I'd like to kind of show them that this kind of story can sell. So that's the selfish part of the answer of how we support other South Asian writers, actors or whatever, you know, I mean, same thing, you know, if you look at like a movie like The Big Sick a couple years ago, you know, um, if The Big Sick didn't do well, and I, it did well, you know, it was up for an Oscar, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, does Kumail Nanjiani get to do another movie? Who knows, you know? But those are the questions that get asked of people that look like Kumail, but not people that look like, say, you know, Ben Affleck. Sure. And like our next question, were there any micro stories you found during this journey that you think you might want to explore further later? Any micro stories? That's a great question. I don't know. Yes, probably. Um, um, but there is um, my brother. He does not have as big a role in the book. My brother's ten years older than me, and not because we we've actually always had a pretty good relationship, you know. But he he was out of the house earlier. You know, when I was eight, he'd gone to college. So like we've never really been in the same place. And so, um, you know, I'd like to explore more of what he thinks. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I didn't include him as much in this is because this was my story to tell and I didn't want to co-opt his story. And so I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, um, you know, be presumptuous. Mm -hmm. But I think, that, you know, maybe one day down the line, my brother and I will, will, uh, will do something. No, that was really interesting because like um, you make clear in the book that like all four members of your family obviously have very different versions of this story, right? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Four books because like, you know, so that is really interesting. Our next question, if you have time, what would be the best job you could have as a journalist? What beat do you lust after? What beat do I lust after? <sighs> oh my gosh. Um, so there are certain writers in the industry that get to kind of six times a year, they'll write a piece. And the pitch process for that piece is like, they'll call up an editor and they'll be like, hey, this is what I'm doing this month. Talk to you later, you know? And they've earned that. They've spent many years, you know, grinding it out. And um, I love doing interviews. I think I'm really good at them. 
I think I, I do a lot of research. I do a lot, I take a lot of care into talking to people, you know, um, and I, I would love, you know, six times a year for me to spend like an hour with someone that is really interesting. And we discuss, we discuss, like we, we just probe, I just probe that person's mind. Um, like I love what Isaac Chotner does over at the New Yorker. I love what he does. Um, and he's great at it. Um, you know, we have some people at the New York Times that do that. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, the, the question you just ask is a conversation I have every day. What is it that I really want? And I don't, sometimes it's something totally different. Like I, I'd love at some point to um, turn, you know, I'd love at some point to go get into the creative fiction world. You know, I've, you know, there are pilots that I've been working on and there's, um, you know, I'm trying to turn, you know, I have a film treatment I'm working on for the book. You know, there's other stuff that I've, in a creative space that I'm working on. And, you know, maybe someday I go full-time into that. Definitely. And um, back to the book, like, what were the biggest questions you felt were unanswered even after you finished writing and even after the journey you detail here? Uh, biggest questions left unanswered. I don't want to give that away because there's a particular part in the book that um, deals with some of this. There's, um, so I don't want to give too much away. I will say, I wish I learned a little bit more about, you know, what was interesting is when I would ask my parents what they wanted to do for a living, because we have this a concept of agency and choice. I'm going to go be a journalist because I want to be a journalist. I'm going to go be um, an actor because I want to be an actor, whatever. With my father and my mother, they were never given that choice. They were just going to do what their parents told them to do. And when I would ask my parents, okay, what, did you, what do you guys want to do? What is that you really want to accomplish with your life? What did, when you were 18, when you were my age, what did you see as your path? And they didn't quite understand the question because they didn't understand the language. And I don't mean the words, I mean the language. They, they, they knew what I was saying, but they didn't understand it. And I wish that, like, I want to know if, like, when, I, when my mom was 15 and when she was, you know, in her room by herself looking into a mirror, was she dreaming of being an astronaut? Like, what was she think? What were her dreams? And my parents did just couldn't really quite understand what I meant by that question because they didn't that kind of thinking didn't occur to them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, those were all of our questions, but I'm just going to ask a question because you're here. Um, so like, how do you think like you cover the MBA? Like um, after one day we're going to be able to leave our houses again. Like how do you think sports is going to be changed by this? Like, especially like I, going I, to Yeah. Um, I have no idea. None of us do. I mean, honestly, I, I wish I had a better We We, again, this is all stuff we think about on a day to day basis. I have no idea. Uh, the NBA in particular for, uh, you know, I don't want to get too in the weeds, is if the season gets canceled, we're looking at possibly billions of dollars lost by the league. And then, and then the NFL starts in the fall and the NBA is completely seated spotlight to that. So we don't know. We just don't know. Um, we know that they're trying hard to rescue the season, mm -hmm. but I just don't know how realistic it is. And all of this, none of us know. How long are we going to be inside? You know, are we, am I gonna am I gonna be on Zoom every day for the rest? You know, till I'm till I'm fifty. You know, uh, is, is this gonna be my social life from here on out? None of us know. Um, so um, this is all very unsettling, and you know, we just don't know right now. And um, obviously, the biggest thing we should all be focused on is getting everybody you know as healthy as we can, and you know, mitigating the effects. But sports is kind of a escapism thing that is not as important as the big picture here. And it did feel like the day the NBA like ended was canceled. It felt like that was the day a lot of people are like, "This is real, right?" Like I don't know, for me at least, it did. Totally. And then in the next twelve hours, several other sports leagues followed: Major League Baseball, NCAA, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, it was uh, yeah, it, it that was the moment. I, you're totally right. Definitely. Um, and I'll throw it back to Mahir um, because those were all of our questions. But yeah, thank you so much for everyone who sent a question and thank you so much. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, well, before, before Mahir, uh, first of all, I really so genuinely thank all of you for coming, uh, whoever, whoever is here. Um, uh, it really means the world to me. This has been a hugely personal project that I am so, uh, I've invested so much into. Wesley has invested a lot into it. Um, and I'm so grateful that you guys took some time out today. Um, if you, it's not an ideal time to be releasing a book in the middle of a global pandemic. 
um, I would you know, really appreciate anyone who would A, pre-order and B, spread the word uh, for the reasons I mentioned before. So thank you so much. I'm really grateful from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Lakshmi. Thank you, Sopan. Thank you both for doing this. Oh. One more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions that they didn't want to ask here or questions about anything, whatever, um, feel free to email me. My email address is uh, sopan.deb, just my name, first name, dot last name at nytimes.com. Feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer. Or if you have your own project or whatever and you want to talk about how, you get, how to get started, I'm happy to chat. Feel free to reach out anytime. Um, that's what we're here for. Anyway, back to you. Sorry, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, and uh, first thing I'll say is I want to apologize to everyone in the meeting who saw the uh, unpleasant thing uh, flash on the screen. We tried to keep trolls out, but uh, got this one pretty quick. If you saw it, apologize and um, try to uh, improve the uh, security of these meetings in the future, which leads me to say we will keep having these meetings in the future. Um, you know, it might not be a book talk. It might be something more casual. Um, it might be some something with editors talk about uh, how to freelance in these hard times. Uh, so keep uh, following us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook. Um, you know, if you're not a member yet, you should become a Saja member. Uh, it's free. The membership's free right now. We're waived memberships for the rest of the year. Um, a few other things we're doing right now that I just want to advertise before we go. Um, there's a there's a forum that we have online now. So if you have questions or if you have concerns or if you have anything you want to share with other members or other people, um, go to saja.org and there's a forum on the homepage. Uh, secondly, we've partnered with the Economic Hardship Reporting Project to offer two $2,500 grants to freelancers who are pursuing um, you know, journalism projects. So um, the information for that application is online. Um, and we still have some applications open for scholarship and internship support, uh, financial support. Um, so just, again, I really want to thank everyone uh, for coming and uh, for um, being part of this conversation and uh, hope to see you all again uh, next time. Well, I'm going to end this meeting. <laughs>